Hi LEGO fans! The 2020 LEGO Harry Potter sets finally arrived and I am beyond excited. I'll be reviewing every set including 75966 Hogwarts Room of Requirement, 75967 Forbidden Forest Umbridge's Encounter, 75968 Four Privet Drive, 75969 Hogwarts Astronomy Tower, 75979 The Hedwig Automaton, and an unexpected bonus, the 40419 Hogwarts Students Accessory Set. I asked you which set you wanted to see first and the response from 1300 votes was overwhelming. So today I'm going to be unboxing, speed building and reviewing set number 75980, Attack on the Burrow from LEGO Harry Potter. Later in the video we'll also be comparing this set side by side with the 2010 version in a Battle of the Burrow Smackdown. This is based on a scene in Harry Potter and the Half-Blood Prince where Death Eaters, Bellatrix Lestrange and Fenrir Greyback attack the home of the Weasleys. Not only that, they stop Harry Potter making out with Ginny. The 1047 piece part count is 84% higher than the original and includes 8 awesome minifigures. We have an all grown up Harry Potter, the future Mrs. Potter Ginny Weasley, Muggle loving Ministry employee Arthur Weasley, the Weasley matriarch and badass jeweller Molly Weasley, and of course Ronald Weasley. We also have Death Eaters Bellatrix Lestrange and child biting werewolf Fenrir Greyback. Finally for the very first time we have an Infidora Tonks minifigure but it looks like somebody forgot to include Remus Lupin. Also included is some animal life including a pig, Errol the Weasley's owl although strictly speaking that bloody bird, Ron's words not mine was grey, and a brand new Hedwig with outstretched wings. The box art for the 2020 sets is in the same style as the 2018 and 2019 sets. If you're one of my American viewers you will notice something missing from the box. That's right, the part count is not shown. Although these sets were released on June 1st in Europe, they don't come out in the USA until August 1st. On the front of the box we see the soon to be destroyed burrow surrounded by flames with minifigures duelling in a vain attempt to try and save the Weasleys home. Poor Molly was even using a bucket to try and quell the flames. Over on the back of the box we get a closer look at the interior of the burrow which is much more elaborately decorated than the 2010 version. We have Ginny's bedroom which seems to have been relocated from the top floor. It looks like Molly's doing a spot of cleaning in the bedroom that Ron shares with Harry. And a neat fold out kitchen for a little Weasley hospitality. On the ground floor we have the Weasley's fire which doubles up as a portal to the flu network just in case you want to go to diagonally. It looks like Ron is sending some correspondence with the help of that bloody bird. And just like the kitchen the sitting room opens up to provide a little bit more breathing space. There's a really nice feature from the movie which allows the flames to be pushed aside so that Harry and Ginny can set off in pursuit of Bellatrix and Fenrir. This is such a cool looking set and is jam packed full of detail which I'm sure means a voluminous sticker sheet. I can't wait to get building so let's open up this box and see what we've got inside. Here's everything that came inside the box. We've got 7 numbered bags of Lego, a 178 page instruction booklet, sticker sheet number 1, sticker sheet number 2, and a selection of 8x16 base plates. I'm going to go ahead and put together set number 75980, Attack on the Burrow, and today this is going to be a 2 minute speed build!
And finally, here it is, the one you've all been waiting for, set number 75980, Attack on the Burrow from LEGO Harry Potter. Build time today was two hours, and it was an absolute joy to put together, with the possible exception of the stickering. We're going to start out by taking a look at every nook and cranny of the burrow, including the sumptuous interior. We'll also be taking a close-up look at each of the minifigures and comparing them to previous versions. Finally, we'll be comparing this side by side with the 4840, the burrow set from 2010. With the minifigures out of the way, this gives us a chance to take a closer look at the Weasley's family home, the burrow. It's located on the outskirts of Pottery St. Catchpole in Devon, England, and is truly a ramshackle building. It was built on the site of a Tudor building, but the only piece that remains is the pig pen. Arthur and Molly moved into the pig pen soon after getting married and built up from there. The burrow is not built to conventional standards and looks like it could fall down at any moment. It's probably a good assumption that there's some magic involved here. Starting at the front of the building, you'll notice it's very skinny and surprisingly straight. I think it's safe to assume this is the original building and Molly and Arthur just built up from there. The style of building here looks like it's been plucked directly from the English countryside. The combination of wood and brickwork that you see on either side of the door in the Z shape is very reminiscent of an English farmhouse. There are several stained glass windows and you'll notice each one of these is different. These were likely salvaged by Molly and Arthur and as you can see no two of them are the same. The front door makes the burrow look very welcoming and we have a vestibule for keeping the rain off while we're casting Aloha Mora. This uses some interesting elements, especially the triangle clip piece. The roof is definitely an eye-catching construction and comes with several different colours of roof tile. Around the side we have the original pig pen from the Tudor construction. The pig is a very vibrant pink colour complete with printed eyes. Now it is the same mould as the one that came with the 2010 burrow, except as you can see here we had more of a kind of ginger colour. Also on the side elevation, looking out over the pig pen, we have this large sand blue window. This is a really nice colour choice and we see it in quite a few places on the burrow. I also like the curved elements used in the wall for the pig pen and we have some great looking cobblestones. Around the back of the burrow we see some interesting features including a gear and there's evidence of two pivot points. We'll come back to those in just a moment. As a technical Lego build, I'm really impressed by the side elevation of the burrow. The upper floors are set at an angle which gives this great character and really helps to recreate the original burrow. If you look very closely you'll see a couple of hinges which gives away some of the magic. This is a really clever design and is a lot more sturdy than you might think. Overall this is a pretty robust Lego build. The only thing I would have done differently is perhaps have some windows around the back. But then again I guess there would be no surfaces for all of the stickers. As we move up the side of the building the architectural style gets a little bit more fancy. The arch detail above this window is very cool and we have some skeleton legs used to construct a railing. Another nice detail is the wooden cladding which uses some really nice printed elements. Towards the top of the building we have an outdoor terrace which is a great place to enjoy a butterbeer on a summer evening. Finally we reach the rooftop of the burrow where we find some more mismatched roof tiles, a hinged cover for the balcony and some slim windows to let in a little light. Finally at the very top we have a chimney complete with chimney pots because the wizarding world hasn't discovered central heating yet. The burrow is an amazing looking building and incorporates some fantastic building techniques but it's not a one trick pony. We also have a bunch of stuff on the inside to check out. The front of the burrow swings open to reveal the Weasley's lounge. But that is not all, oh no that is not all. The other side of the burrow is completely open revealing rooms spread across five levels. We even have a fold-out dining area to give the Weasleys more room for entertaining. The kitchen and dining area is all set up for breakfast, but I'm pretty sure the attack on the burrow took place at night. On the dining table we have some great printed elements showing fried eggs and waffles. Waffles aren't actually a traditional English breakfast food, so I prefer to think of these as crumpets. The Weasleys are definitely not a wealthy wizarding family, as Malfoy likes to point out. They do, however, make the most of what they've got, and I love the mismatched coloured chairs. As well as a bunch of food, we have cups and mugs, what looks like a coffee pot, and some syrup to put on those waffles. Everything the Weasleys could ever need is found inside their burrow, even the kitchen sink. I love the gold faucet element, and even the trans blue in the bottom of the sink to show water. There are also some jars and a bottle, and that most English of things, an idea we stole from the Chinese, a teapot. 
For a more cosy and compact layout, we can always fold in the kitchen. On the side here we have a couple of potted plants, maybe a new crop of mandrakes, and you can get a slightly better look at one of these stickered stained glass windows. Beyond the kitchen we can see some familiar heirlooms within the Weasley's home. In particular we have what looks like a grandfather clock, but this is actually a device which tells Molly where her family are. The sticker really doesn't do this justice, but each one of the hands shows a member of the Weasley family. The hand denotes whether that person is travelling, lost, in mortal peril, or playing Quidditch. Ignoring the fact that we actually have three stickers on this piece of furniture, it is quite the complicated magical chronometer. There are various flywheels and pendulums helping this thing to tick. Next to the clock we have a comfortable looking armchair and up on the wall some kind of artwork. This depicts a cauldron boiling up some kind of potion complete with flames and stars and stuff. Tucked away on the right hand side of the clock in the dark is a thin but perfectly functional set of bookshelves. Moving on up to the next floor we have Ginny Weasley's bedroom. Thankfully the upper floors are detachable so we can actually let some more light in. The bedroom is small but has everything a teenage witch could want. She has a bed made up in the colours of her favourite Quidditch team, the Hollyhead Harpies. Ginny actually played for the Hollyhead Harpies in the early 2000s before she had children and became the Quidditch correspondents for the Daily Prophet. There's also a dresser complete with brush for that awesome red hair and a stickered mirror. Applying a round sticker to a round Lego piece is my idea of hell. Displayed high up on the wall is a broom. And then we have a music poster for the Weird Sisters, whose greatest hits include Do the Hippogriff, Magic Works, and This is the Night. The panel making up the other wall is just blank, and actually LEGO could have put a window in here. Before I reattach the upper levels, here's a quick look at the base on which they sit. It's so simple but so neat, and makes a really firm foundation. Moving up to the next level of accommodation, I believe this is the bedroom that Molly shares with Arthur. On the left hand side we find a small seating area, complete with armchair where Molly does her knitting. Or more precisely where the knitting knits itself. It looks like we have another Weasley sweater in production, and I love the use of magic wands in place of knitting needles. Hidden away on the back wall is a family portrait showing the Weasley family in Egypt. In the summer of 1993, Arthur Weasley won the Galleon draw and received a prize of 700 galleons. The whole family went on a summer vacation to visit Bill in Egypt, and they even had enough money on return to buy a new wand for Ron. On the other side we have a double bed complete with patchwork quilt which kind of illustrates the Weasleys make do and mend mentality to life. The next level up is the highest bedroom in the house, and this belongs to Ron. In reality I'm sure there are meant to be bunk beds in this room for when Harry comes to stay. Ron's bed is decorated with the colours of the Chudley Cannons, who are members of the British and Irish Quidditch League. The Chudley Cannons are famous for having won the League Cup 21 times. The art on the wall is really neat and also based on the Chudley Cannons. Until 1972 their motto was, we shall conquer, but then they changed it to what you see here. Let's all just keep our fingers crossed and hope for the best. A couple of steps lead up out of the bedroom and onto a really nice veranda. To a muggle like you or I, this actually looks really dangerous. But to a well-trained wizard, I'm sure this is the perfect place to kick off and go for some flying practice. There's not very much at the top of the house, and honestly this is probably just attic space. It does however make a great place for Errol and Hedwig to hang out. We'll take a look at them a little bit later. Right now we need to head back down to ground level to finish up our tour of the burrow. Inside overlooking the pig pen is a really nice seating area complete with comfy couch. It's the perfect place for young love to blossom over a tray of mince pies. The decoration is really nice, complete with floor lamp, bottle, and a plant. Over in the other corner we have a cosy pair of candles. In the centre of the room you'll find a cosy fire complete with orange flames. That is unless you've got somewhere you need to be in a hurry. On the table by the side of the fire we have some correspondence and a jar containing strange powder. No, not that kind of strange powder, this is magical stuff. Remember that gear on the side of the house from earlier? This transforms the flames from a gentle glowing orange to a vibrant neon green for the flu network. Really difficult to see because they're so hidden away are two pieces of artwork on the wall of the lounge. One shows a unicorn in the forest and the other a phoenix rising from the flames. I have a sneaky suspicion the kids may have painted these. Now of course this set is called Attack on the Burrow and a big part of the attack was encircling the burrow with flames. It's likely this was just a tactic to draw out Harry Potter, and it certainly worked. The flames themselves play a very small part in this set. 
we have a 2x12 plate complete with six flame elements. The middle two are hinged, which allows the flames to be beaten back with magic. This creates a gap which allows Ginny and Harry to pursue Bellatrix and Fenrir. It's a really nice recreation of the way things played out in the movie. It's good, but if I'm honest, I prefer the way they portrayed this scene with the 2010 set. So there you have the magnificent 2020 Burrow set, and in just two shakes of a hippogriff's tail, we're going to be comparing it to the 2010 version. Before then, we have eight magically magnificent minifigures to take a look at. Molly Weasley, Arthur Weasley, Ron Weasley, Ginny Weasley, Nymphadora Tonks, Harry James Potter, Bellatrix Lestrange, and biter of children Fenrir Greyback. We're starting out with Molly Weasley, who was born into the Pruitt family around 1950. Like all of the Weasleys, she was sorted into Gryffindor House at Hogwarts and went on to have seven children with Arthur Weasley. A fiercely protective matriarch, she went on to kill Bellatrix Lestrange in retribution for the deaths of Remus Lupin and Nymphadora Tonks. Bellatrix nearly took out Ginny Weasley, but apparently this overstepped the mark. Not my daughter, you b Molly's costume is a pretty good recreation of what she wore in the movie. Rather than minifigure legs, we have one of these undecorated skirt pieces. It's a shame we have no printing on the front of that piece, as it does look like she should be wearing an apron. The torso print is super sharp and detailed, and shows what looks to be a homemade top. I really like the flowers which are stitched around the neckline. There's a little bit more printing around the back, and you can see where the waist is cinched by either the belt or the apron strings. I've got to say the facial print isn't exactly flattering. In the book, Molly is described as quite a large woman, and I think that's the look they're going for. Although Julie Walters wore padding during the movie, her face wasn't nearly this bloated. There is an alternate expression complete with smile, but this just makes her look maniacal. Another detail I'm not really fond of is the hair, which is a real step backwards from the 2010 minifigure. We've only ever had two Molly Weasley minifigures, and the older one outclasses the newer one in every way. The skirt piece is a step in the right direction, but dropping the printing was a bad idea. The continuity of the printing from the torso onto the legs in the 2010 minifigure was absolutely fantastic. Similarly with the faces and the hair, the Molly Weasley on the right looks a lot more friendly. Mashing all of the best parts together, which are mostly 2010 pieces, we get a much better Molly Weasley. Moving on from Molly Wobbles, we get to Arthur Weasley, who bears an uncanny resemblance to an older Ron. He was also sorted into Gryffindor House, and soon after graduating married Molly Pruitt. His costume includes standard grey minifigure legs, and a torso print which cuts off abruptly at the waistband. Arthur is rocking a shirt and tie, and a very comfortable looking cardigan. Man, I must be getting old saying things like that. There's more printing around the back, showing all of the pattern in the cardigan. I'm not sure if this is something Molly knitted, or whether it's a bunch of old worn out cardigans stitched together. It is a shame that we don't have any arm printing to match the pattern. Usually when I see the face of Arthur Weasley, I'm reminded of Jesse's diets. This face is more generic and doesn't really scream Arthur Weasley. There is of course an alternate expression which shows Arthur looking a little bit more reproachful. The hair is a familiar element, and was actually used on the 2010 Arthur Weasley. Next we have Ronald Billius Weasley, or One One, who is giving me a sense of deja vu. I'll explain why in just a second. Ron is named after Uncle Billius, who is said to have gone loopy towards the end of his life. This minifigure uses standard black legs, which are longer than the ones used in other 2018-2019 sets. Speaking of those other sets, I knew I'd seen that torso before. It was used in set number 75947, Hagrid's Hut Buck Beaks Rescue from 2019, and of course you'll find a comprehensive review of that set on my channel. Just like the torso, the facial expression is recycled from the earlier set, and we have a slightly more sourpuss expression around the back. We do get a trendier, more grown-up haircut, but I'm pretty sure that's been used on other Ron Weasley minifigures. If you're into collecting, there are around 20 minifigures, microfigures, and statuettes of Ron Weasley to collect. Moving on from the youngest son, we have the only girl in the Weasley family. This is Ginevra Molly Weasley, also known as Ginny, and sometimes Gin, and she of course goes on to be the future Mrs. Potter. Ginny's dressed in the same outfit she was wearing when trying to seduce Harry Potter with a tray of mince pies. I'm pretty sure the right hand sleeve had a pattern, but that is not replicated on the minifigure. We do have some more printing around the back, which just outlines the shape of the body. The facial expression is pretty good, and depicts a strong and confident young woman. There is another which shows a slightly less confident Miss Weasley, and I really like this one, this is so cool. I'm also a big fan of red hair, and this is a great Lego hairpiece. 
In fact, it's the same one they used on the 2010 minifigure, and it looks great both then and now. I like both torso prints equally, but it's a shame we don't get the leg printing on the newer version. The only completely new character in this set is Nymphadora Tonks, who's never appeared as a minifigure before. Tonks is an ex-Hufflepuff student, and went on to become an aura under the watchful eye of Alistair Moody. Again, I'm disappointed with the lack of printing on the legs, but we do get a nice torso print. You have to get the light just right, but when you do, you see a lot of metallic detail in the print. The costume is very well fitted, and almost hugs the body like a corset. Tonks is a metamorphmagus, which means she has a rare ability to change her appearance through sheer will alone. This is demonstrated a couple of times in the movies, including when Moody calls her Nymphadora and her hair turns red with rage. The facial expression is a little generic, but it does resemble Tonks. Of course, we do have an alternate expression, and this shows the more fearsome side of the aura. The hair does look like a stock Lego piece, but it does suit Tonks really well. I will say this is a good, but not great Tonks minifigure. I think LEGO played it safe with the design, and it would have been nice to have maybe got some colour changing hair or something. Before we get to the Death Eaters, this guy needs almost no introduction. It is of course Harry James Potter. LEGO's made at least 43 minifigures, micro figures and statuettes of Harry Potter, so I really don't need to go into his backstory here. The costume is quite simple, with standard blue legs, and a grey hoodie over a red t-shirt. He could almost be Tom Scott. There's more printing around the back, showing the hood and some creases, and then a very familiar and very refined Harry Potter expression. The alternate expression shows Harry looking very much less impressed. The hair shows a much more mature Harry Potter and hides the lightning-shaped scar. It is there, it's just hidden away underneath the hairline. It's not easy to get excited about yet another Harry Potter minifigure, but this is quite a good one. We will be seeing him again in 75967, Forbidden Forest, Umbridge's Encounter. Finally, we get to the bad dudes, and this is Bellatrix Lestrange of the Noble House of Black. It won't be a surprise, but of course she was sorted into Slytherin House. One thing you may not know about Bellatrix is that sometime between 1996 and 1998, Bellatrix and Voldemort got it on and had a baby. I'm guessing they forgot to use Protego, and the resulting offspring is yet another Horcrux that Voldemort didn't intend to make. The baby's name was Delphine, and her first words were Abadada Kadada. Bellatrix's robes are in her family colours, and incorporate a sweeping skirt piece. Just like the piece that came with Molly, this is unprinted. There's some great printed detail on the torso, showing the lacy robes. And we even have metallic detail for the pendant, which is in the shape of a bird's skull. Around the back you can see the corset, which is part of the costume, and the Death Eater's hood. The first expression is really nice, and has a good resemblance to Helen Bonham Carter. The second, on the other hand, shows Bellatrix flying into a maniacal rage. The hair was designed specifically for Bellatrix, and looks fantastic. We've got curls hanging down at the front, and also curls around the back. The same hairpiece can also be found on the 2010 Bellatrix from the 4840 Burrow set. The older minifigure is much more elaborately printed, and is actually quite desirable to collectors. One of these is going to set you back $30 to $40. To give it credit, I think I prefer the facial expression on the new version, but everything else is better on the old. Part of that preference might be because we have a slight misprint on this Bellatrix. There's absolutely nothing wrong with this new Bellatrix, I just don't think LEGO are trying as hard with some of these 2020 minifigures. With that in mind, let's see what they've done to Jeff Goldblum's lycanthropy-afflicted cousin. This is of course Fenrir Greyback, a werewolf notorious for his savagery and preference for attacking children. Lego clearly heard me complaining, because this time we do actually get printed legs. We actually get some nice continuity of the robe printing from the torso onto the legs. Fenrir has quite the crop of chest hair, and some battle scars to go with it. The printing around the back, in contrast, just shows the creases in his jacket. The facial expression is great, and shows Fenrir's hairy face and fangs. The alternate expression is a little less jovial, and this time you can see the pupils more clearly. The hair is a good fit for a werewolf, and incorporates a widow's peak. The same hair mould was used in the last Fenrir Greyback minifigure back in 2010. It seems that time has not been good to Fenrir, and he's had to start hitting the hair dye. Both of these minifigures make a great addition to LEGO Harry Potter, but I just think the 2010 version has slightly better printing. I did promise to give you a closer look at the owls, and here they are. The brown one, which I think is meant to be the Weasley's Owl Errol, is an older element, and we had these back in the 2010 Harry Potter sets. 
It's a nicely sculpted piece with the wings folded around the back. This version of Hedwig is new for 2020 and shows her with her wings outstretched. There's some really nice sculpted details for both the wing feathers and the tail feathers, and some sharp printing for the downy feathers on the front, the eyes and the beak. It's a really nice rendering of Hedwig, and I don't think this is going to be the last time we'll see her in a 2020 set. So 75980 Attack on the Burrow is a great set with a bunch of awesome minifigures and some really cool interior details. So what could be better than having a LEGO recreation of the Burrow? Having two LEGO recreations of the Burrow. This is set number 4840, the Burrow from 2010. Up to now, this has been one of my favourite LEGO sets. One of the immediate differences between the two sets is the scale. The 2010 set had 568 pieces, whereas the 2020 set has 1047. That's 84% more LEGO. Both sets included some fire, but I have to say the 2010 version did a better job of recreating the marshland. Both sets also include a fireplace, which gives access to the flu network, but I think the 2020 version is much better here. In 2010, the fireplace was a standalone part and wouldn't fit inside the burrow. The new burrow has a height advantage, standing about 13.5 inches tall instead of just 12 inches tall. It also has a much more authentic, wobbly appearance, whereas the older set looks positively straight in comparison. Both sets featured a pig pen, albeit with different breeds of pig. The pig that came with the 2010 set looked very much like a Tamworth. The basic structure of both models is pretty similar. At the front we have a door complete with porch, and each includes the original building from which the burrow was built up. The architectural style of the 2010 set is definitely a little bit more reserved. The roof tiles on the new version are a heck of a lot more colourful. What really sets these two models apart are the interiors. As you can see in the 2020 version, we just have a lot more stuff. When comparing the dining areas, for instance, you can see where a lot of the extra elements came from. One detail I do miss from the 2010 version is that charming little kitchen. One thing the new burrow has over the old one is the amount of upstairs bedrooms. Back in 2010, we only got two. One shared by Harry and Ron, which had bunk beds, and Ginny's room, complete with a copy of the Quibbler right at the top. The newer version has more bedrooms and more space overall, although I do think Ginny's bedroom is in the wrong place. So now we have two burrows, I guess the question is which one is the best? I like both of these sets and I wouldn't part with either of them. There's no doubt the 2020 version is more polished, I love the way it's been built at a slight angle, and as much as I hate the stickers there are some really nice details. I also like the simplicity and charm of the 2010 version. The designers did a great job with the much smaller part count and the minifigures were absolutely awesome. In fact, if I was to choose minifigures from the old burrow or the new burrow, I would definitely go with the old burrow. Sure, it's nice to get a Tonks, but I really hate what they did with Molly. So that was set number 75980, Attack on the Burrow from LEGO Harry Potter. I've been eagerly anticipating this set as much as I know you guys have, and I'm not disappointed. Sure, the minifigures might not be quite as good as the 2010 version. I love the design with the upper floor set at an angle. I like the extra colour and the interiors are a great improvement over the 2010 version. The only problem with having built this set is figuring out which one to build next. I've not decided yet, so I'm going to leave that as a complete surprise for the next video. I've really enjoyed putting this set together and sharing it with you guys. If you enjoyed it too, a thumbs up is always appreciated, and don't forget to subscribe for more LEGO Harry Potter goodness. I'll be back again soon with another one of the 2020 LEGO Harry Potter sets, so thanks a million for checking out today's review, stay safe, and we'll see you on the next build video.